Over a month ago, I decided to start the hardest Skyrim challenge ever, and I never realized just how hard it would be. But with a lot of time, a lot of patience, and a lot of trial and error, this is how I beat Skyrim's hardest challenge, Skyrim Beyond Legendary. Before we get into it, there are some rules that you need to know. If you want a comprehensive overview of all the rules, check out my first video of the series, which is linked in the description. But this video will be entirely self-contained, so I'll cover all of the rules as they come up. The goal is to kill the big bad Alduin and finish the main quest. I can't use glitches or hire any followers as I feel that like they would go against the spirit of the challenge. Other than that, I can do anything that the game allows me to do. For the entire game, I'll be playing on Legendary Difficulty, which means that enemies take 1 fourth normal damage and I take 3 times normal damage. This is going to make me play incredibly carefully as any attack has a chance to one-shot me. Additionally, I'll be playing with the new survival mode active, which has a lot of effects on the game, but I'll talk about each one of them when they become relevant. For now, just know that we start out with half of our typical carry weight and our health doesn't passively regenerate. Like survival mode, I have a few mods installed to make the challenge more interesting, but I'll bring up each one when they come up. And finally, I'll be playing with permadeath, which means that if I die, I need to start a new game from the beginning. Now that we understand what we're dealing with, let's get into the game where we meet our hero, Sullivan the Orc. As you can see, this probably isn't the start that you're used to, and that's thanks to the first mod I installed called Alternate Life. This gives me a variety of different starting scenarios and it helps each of my runs feel unique from each other, as well as not having to sit through the opening cutscene, saving us about 2 hours each run. For this run, we're choosing to start as a Vigilant of Stendar. We do this for a few reasons, with the largest one being that it starts us with access to a lot of gold and a lot of ingredients. So we loot these poor folk for everything that they own and head out on our journey. Once we exit, we can see that we're not too far from Dawnstar, so we start our trek there, saying hi to a few friendly giants and expertly navigating around some not so friendly wolves for a group of caravan traders come to our aid. The rest of the trip to Dawnstar is uneventful, with us occasionally picking up some flowers and berries when we see them. Now that we're in Dawnstar, we beeline to the town hall and buy the spell Muffle from the court wizard so we can start leveling up our illusion skill. We then steal some more golden ingredients head out, and take the ferry to Windhelm. Windhelm is only a connecting stop, as we're just coming here to use the carriage to Falkreath. While we're here, I can explain to you why we did all this. As part of the alternate life mod, we can't start the main quest until we go to Helgen, and Falkreath is the closest town we can catch a ride to. So, we set off on our journey to Helgen, and it immediately starts to get rocky. We first encounter a lone wolf, which isn't that big of a deal. Even when we're taking three times the damage, it still can't kill us before we have a chance to heal or run away. The larger problem is that now we've gotten the attention of some ill-mannered bandits, which absolutely run the risk of killing us. So we do what we do best and run away as fast as we can, which gets both the wolf and the bandits off our back. Now that we're in Helgen, we need to do some detective work and find the journal of some dude that decided a dragon attack was the perfect time to jot down some notes. From that, we learn that there's a couple of people trapped in a nearby cave, so we go save the only dude that we care about and GTF out of there. Now that we've got the main quest, we head to Riverwood, making a quick stop at the Mage Stone to get a passive bonus that makes leveling up our magic skills 20% easier. Since I've got this bonus, we can start power leveling the most important skill to this entire challenge, Illusion. While we power level, I'll use this time to explain how leveling up magic skills work while you watch this episode of Life BD. So, in order to gain XP for a certain magic skill, there are up to two requirements. The first requirement is that you cast a spell on a valid target. This makes it so you can't level up your destruction skill just by shooting firebolts into the sky. The second, and sometimes optional requirement, is that there must be an enemy nearby. This prevents using conjuration or armor spells when out of combat to gain free levels. Thankfully, we were able to pick up the Muffle spell earlier, which uses us as the target and doesn't require enemies nearby. Because we meet these requirements, we're free to level all the way to 100 illusion. This is where we encounter our second mod, Ordinator, which replaces all of the original perk trees. I added this to make the game more interesting for me, 
as I've played way too much Skyrim and this serves as an incentive to not play as a stealth archer each run. So with all of our newfound perk points, we get some perks that make our illusion spells stronger, one that lets us cast illusion spells on most enemies, and an interesting perk that deals 40 damage per second to an enemy that we hit with a fury spell, as long as we're near them and there are no other enemies nearby. Now, if you're especially sharp, you may have noticed that the game has gotten a very slight red tint to it. That's because we've been neglecting one aspect of survival mode, hunger. Hunger is a constantly growing status effect that reduces our maximum stamina the longer we go without eating. It also reduces our attack speed and weapon damage, but I'll be using spells so it doesn't affect us too much. When we eat, our hunger is reduced and our max stamina goes back to normal. Simple enough. From here, we go by the spell Fury, advance the main quest, and head to Whiterun to let the Jarl know about that dang dragon attack. After that, we talk to his court wizard, Farangar, and he lets us know about an ancient dragon artifact in Bleak Falls Barrow. We promptly ignore his message and decide to hitch a ride to the College of Winterhold. Once inside, we prove our abilities as an academic weapon to the Professor Tolfdir and get a quest to explore some Nordic ruins nearby. We make our way there and get through the dungeon with relative ease using Fury to make the Draugr inside take each other out while conjuring a Flame Atronach to fight for us when it came down to only one Draugr left. We enter the final boss room where this nice fellow seems to be pondering his orb before making him fight an endless wave of Flame Atronachs and taking him out with a bound sword. Now that that's done and over with, we make our way back to the college to cash in on the only reason we came here, the Archmage's gear. We can now access a previously locked room that has two pieces of clothing that will come very much in handy. The first being a pair of boots that increase our shock resistance by 40% and the second and more important being a pair of robes that increase our magicka regeneration by 100%. It also reduces the magicka costs of all spells by 15%. Now that we're decked out in mage's gear, we can get back to working on the main quest. All we need to do is make it back to Riverwood. So yeah, now's a good time to mention another survival mode aspect no fast travel. This is by far the worst part of this entire challenge. See, all parts of the main quest have predetermined enemy spawns, meaning that as long as I do my research, I can be prepared for everything that the game throws at me. The exact opposite happens when we need to travel to and from various locations, as each trip has a chance to spawn any number of random enemies and encounters. Because we can't fast travel, I'll be vulnerable to beast attacks, cultists, assassins, dragons, and an endless array of other goodies. Another problem with no fast travel helps introduce another mechanic of survival mode, cold. As we get exposed to the harsh climate of Skyrim, our warmth will decrease. This is similar to hunger, but instead of stamina, it reduces our max health and makes us move slower. We can increase our warmth by moving to a warmer area, standing next to a fire, or eating hot food. So with this knowledge, we can now start our trek down to Windhelm, where we'll be able to take the carriage to Whiterun. Pretty quickly though, we run into a cave bear. Very deadly, but also pretty predictable. We use this opportunity to try and gain destruction levels, but we run out of magicka right when the bear targets us, and I realize that this might be where the run ends. I'll let you see how this plays out. Oh my god. I have to hope that he stops and tries to do like a slash attack instead of doing like a lunge attack. If he does a lunge attack, I think I'm just dead. I won't have time to cast Calm. This is going to be so stupid if I die. Oh my god. Because I could have prevented this so easily. I just thought I was better. Okay. I've got to use my Berserker Rage. Go! Go! bugged out the game. By the grace of God, we survived with such little health that the UI actually rounded it down to zero. As you may have seen, we used our unique orcish racial ability, which makes us take half damage for 60 seconds. This is incredibly useful for when we get in sticky situations like these. In the meantime though, 
we collect ourselves and continue our journey to Windhelm with a new understanding of the word careful and a little brown stain in my pants. We get there just in the nick of time as Sullivan was about to freeze to death, which can actually happen as it ended multiple of my previous attempts at this challenge. But we warm back up and take the carriage back to Whiterun where we sleep for the night. We wake up, filled with spunk up to the brim, and head out to start the first real mission of the main quest. Before we leave, we stop by the stables just out of town and get the one and only lifelong companion, Sullivan's horse. With our trusty steed, we head up to Bleak Falls Barrow without too many problems. Sullivan's horse got a little bit scared in the heat of battle, but this is his first combat, so we'll let it slide. We handle the bandits outside without too many problems, using fury to make them fight until only one remains, then using calm to keep the last one off our back. We use this tactic throughout pretty much the entire dungeon, and get through pretty easily, with our only real snag being us bugging off a ledge and almost dying to fall damage. We make it to the final door of the dungeon before I realize that I forgot to pick up the key that we were supposed to loot about 10 rooms ago. So we go back and retrieve it, head into the final chamber where a new hand touches the beacon, and start the battle that made my entire plan come crashing down onto me. See, in Skyrim, there's what are called leveled enemies. This means that these enemies level up as we level up, keeping the game balance at all stages of our playthrough. This is a major problem for us. See, earlier when we were leveling up our illusion, we were also leveling up our character, thus leveling up our enemies. The issue is that we can't use illusion to kill an enemy in a 1v1. So, we're level 17 with the combat prowess of a 4th grader, going up against a Draugr that's now strong enough that it could go toe to toe with the Undertaker. Even with this cool staff we picked up that deals a lot more damage than any of our spells, we hardly make a dent in his health bar. On top of this, we've only got enough soul gems to recharge the staff twice. Thankfully, my quick wit allowed me to think of a solution. Using a different spell. Our new robes recharge our magicka quick enough that we can summon Flame Atronach after Flame Atronach. This will let us cheese the fight in a way that we won't ever really be in danger, as the Draugr will always be targeting our summon. So, this fight becomes a war of nutrition, and we've got just enough cheese to win. We leave the ruins, pick up Sullivan's horse, and head back to Whiterun with only a couple of random encounters of people that want to hurt us. I count that as a win. Now that we're in Whiterun, we just need to turn in the dragon's stone. I forgot to loot the dragon stone off the boss's body, which means that we have to go all the way back and pick it up. This wouldn't be that bad except for the part where I kept leaving one enemy alive because I didn't want to fight them. Nonetheless, we make it through probably being the first person ever to enter Bleak Falls Barrow twice within a single playthrough and turn in the dragon stone for real this time. After this, we get news of another dragon sighting and swiftly head out to see what's going on. And by swiftly, of course, I mean after a good night's rest, which brings up one of the last survival mode additions, fatigue. Like in real life, our hero Sullivan constantly gets more tired the longer he's awake, and similar to hunger and cold, our max magicka is reduced the longer we go without sleeping, as well as our potion effectiveness and our magic regeneration is reduced. So about once a day, we need to sleep to keep our fatigue low. This serves a dual purpose, as sleeping is also the only way to level up. Another addition to survival mode that prevents us from healing to full if we save our level ups for when we're low on health. Now that that boring information is done with, we head to fight our worst enemy, a dragon. Dragons are our biggest threat for a thousand reasons, but I'll just explain the top few. All dragons are leveled enemies, illusion spells don't work against dragons, any of their attacks result in a near instant death for us, and on top of that, we can't prepare for all dragon fights as they can spawn as one of the random encounters I was talking about earlier. Thankfully though, this is one of the easiest dragon fights in the game. There are plenty of guards to attack for us, and the watchtower grants us perfect cover against all of its attacks. So we pretty much just wait inside the whole time and summon flame Atronachs, and the fight is over in no time. Now that that's over, we gently suck the dragon's essence and head back to the Jarl. On our way there, we hear some old oh, men yelling at the clouds, bah, but I doubt key. that has anything to do with what just happened. So it turns out that it does in fact have something to do with what just happened, and the Jarl informs us that we need to go speak with the Greybeards at their conveniently located monastery at the top of the tallest mountain in Skyrim. We ride Sullivan's horse to Iverstead, 
the closest town to our destination, and decide to hike all 7,000 steps without Sullivan's horse. We do this because the path to the top is riddled with frost trolls and ice wraiths, and we can't cast calm on them while we're on horseback. Once we get to High Hrothgar, we prove to them that we're dragonborn by gently sucking their essence, shouting a few times, and running away. Understandably impressed, they assign us with the task of retrieving some lame horn. Since we have nothing else better to do, we run back down the mountain and into some cultists that really want to harsh our style. Typically, we wouldn't be able to kill these guys because they have really strong magic, but the townspeople decide to give us a hand with this one. With that problem settled, we ride Sullivan's horse all the way to Riften, where we can take carriage to Morthal. From there, it's just a short trip to Utsengrav, where the horn of Jürgen Windcaller lies. Outside of the tomb, there are a few bandits and a necromancer waiting for us, but we're able to handle them relatively easily as long as we stay careful. On the necromancer's body, we find a spell tome from another mod, Necromantic Grimoire, which adds a bunch more necromancy spells. Despite this, Conjure and Dying Ghost is the only spell we ended up using from that mod. Its stats are better than our Flame Matronach, so we'll be using it instead. This dungeon is pretty cut and dry. We conjure, use fury, and then calm the last enemy. Once we make it through, we realize that we've been cucked and someone else took the horn, but at least they had the decency to leave a note telling us where to meet. Thankfully, to get there, it's just a straight shot to solitude where we can take a carriage to Whiterun so we can ride to Riverwood. I love no fast travel. Once we get there, we find out that the author of the note was none other than this person who really hates dragons, so much so that she wants to go kill a dragon right now. Delphine, being a real one, acts as a temporary follower while we make our way to the dragon burial mound. This turns out to be incredibly helpful, as there was an assassin nearby ready to beat our bum, but Delphine took care of him. We make it to the dragon site and start our second dragon fight. This one is much more difficult than the first. There aren't a bunch of guards nearby to help us, and there's not an area that's safe like the watchtower was. Thankfully, there's a very well-placed bulbous rock that we were able to duck around while Delphine and our flame matronach did all the work. Like before, we suck the soul out of the dragon, and our new friend is so impressed that she wants us to do a little espionage on the Thalmor. Before we do that though, we're high enough level that we can upgrade our armor spell. So, we head back to the big glowing orb from earlier where Tolfdir is. Unfortunately for us, a dragon decided to get revenge for its brother we just killed. Knowing that I can't kill the dragon by myself, I do the one thing that I'm best at, running away. We can't just run away all willy nilly however. If we did that, then the dragon could still be there when we tried to go back. So we kite the dragon all the way to the College of Winterhold where there are plenty of overpowered wizards that can kill it for me. After sucking the dragon's soul out of its body, we head to Tolfdir to learn Iron Flesh, which gives us 80 armor, and we also pick up Detect Life for a couple of reasons. First, Detect Life makes it easier for us to spot enemies, but more importantly, it's great at power leveling our alteration skill. Remember what I said before about leveling magic skills. We need a valid target and possibly a nearby enemy. Detect Life doesn't require an enemy nearby, and every living creature within the spell's range counts as a valid target. So. We head to Solitude where there are always a bunch of people and start power leveling. A couple Channel 5 videos later and we've got level 100 alteration. Before we start our espionage mission, Delphine wants us to meet back up with her in Riverwood. So we leave from Solitude and when we get there she tells us to go to Solitude. If that wasn't enough of a kick in the teeth, as soon as we head out, we're attacked by a dragon. Like last time, all we need to do is let the people around us kill the dragon while we do nothing. This worked for most of the fight, but eventually the dragon killed everyone else. Thankfully, it was low enough health that we could kill it with some firebolts. After finishing it off and sucking its essence, we head back to Tolfdir again to start the Master Alteration quest, where we need to loot a knife from some ruins near Markarth. Before we do that though, we should meet with Delphine in Solitude. So after leaving Tolfdir, we hop on Sullivan's ho- A travesty. I'll let myself explain to you. How this loss made me feel. Come on, not Sullivan's horse. Oh my god, look at what they did to my boy. You were one in a million. And may your soul forever rest in peace.
Sullivan's horse. Man, I gotta run all the way back. <sighs> this means that we need a thousand stones to be able to buy a new horse. We head back to the college to make some potions and sell everything we own. So, Sullivan's horse died, we just sold all of our personal belongings, and now we need to walk to Windhelm. We quickly encounter a snow bear that gives us deja vu, but we recently picked up a shout that lets us become invincible for a few seconds, which prevents us from almost certain death. The rest of the trek isn't very eventful, we take the carriage to solitude. Okay, now, this is editor edge, not narrator edge anymore. I am so, so, so very sorry to say this, but I forgot to hit record when I was playing through this next segment. Uh, you're just going to have to take my word that I didn't die during this part, but I streamed it all on Twitch so my viewers can vouch for me. Um, but since I don't have the video, I'll give you the next best thing, a perfectly accurate retelling of the story as I remember it. I travel to the Thalmor Embassy. The moon hangs high in the night sky as the drizzle of rain stings my face in the crisp northern air. I'm wearing party clothes to keep suspicion off me. Despite being an orcish mage, I'm also a damn good undercover agent. The bouncer looks at me up and down. God damn it, he knows. He asks for my name. Sullivan, I say, with beads of sweat forming on my forehead mixing in with the midnight rain. It's been months, years even, since he asked me that question. He finally responds. Go ahead. They don't make men like me anymore. Men that are experts of their craft and get shit done. I walk in the embassy and I'm greeted by the host of the party, the oh high and mighty Altmer Ellenwin. I don't even listen to what she says to me. If she told me that Mammoth's fur was brown, she'd be lying. I'd have kicked her teeth in right then and there, but no, I'm on a mission. And if there's one thing I'm not, it's inefficient. I'm vulnerable. If I get sussed out by any of the 15 people here, I'd be dead before I hit the ground. I need to find a distraction. Luckily, we've planned this all out. Another agent, Malborn, is ready to help me gather intelligence. He hands me a bottle of brandy, and I offer it to a drunk if he does my bidding. Am I evil? This man clearly needs help, and I'm offering them the one thing he shouldn't have. Never mind that. We all have our vices. He holds up his end of the bargain, and Malborn and I are able to sneak into the kitchen during the chaos. It's here that I'm able to slip back into my gear. I feel the powers of the gods flowing through me as I put on my worn robes. I'm ready. I crawl forwards. There's two soldiers in the room to my left. Not a problem. I've been invisible all my life. I won't be noticed by these shitheads. I take a step. They see me. Fuck. It's okay. I prepared for this. I let the magic flow through me as I cast calm on the two soldiers. Before I could get it off though, the second one shouts. It alerts the others. Fuck. I'm in shit deeper than my grave. I need to get the information get out, When I'm not going down easily, I make a run for it. I open the first door I find and enter a courtyard. Four more soldiers are awaiting me. Maybe I can get past them? Fat chance. They're casting spells way out of my league. I try and navigate around them right as three more soldiers enter the courtyard. Fuck! I try to get by, but they keep sending a barrage of fireballs my way. I'm breathing my last breath. I'm better than this. I'm a fucking weapon. I can do this. I drink a potion and I can stand again. I look to the stars and channel the power of my ancestors. At that moment, they blessed me with the power of the orcs that came before me. It's a good day to be green. I bob and I weave. I cast calm on all their sorry asses. Try to explain this one to your higher ups, you bunch of pricks. I head into the building opposite of the party. Seems like this is some sort of prison. There's a man locked up in chains inside one of the cells. I could help him. Just then, two Thalmor walk up to the cage. Rulandil and one of his lackeys. It's fine. 
The information I need is in a chest right next to Rulandil. I'm not taking any chances, so I call them both. I reach into the chest and pull out some research notes. God damn it. This is worse than we ever could have thought. These dragons are just coming back to life. They're being resurrected. There's something about a man, Esbern, trapped in the rift in Ratway Warrens. Now's not the time. I've got bigger things to deal with. Two more Thalmor goons walk in from the courtyard with Malborn imprisoned in their arms. The way out is a locked trap door and I don't have the key. <laughs> this has just become a hell in a cell and I'm about to prove it to him. I cast fury on one of them. I'm sorry for that poor fuck's family they don't deserve it. But I didn't get hired to give a shit about their families. I cast fury on all of them. Bloodbath ensues as one's colleagues slice each other's throats. Somehow, Malborn survives the carnage along with Rulandil. Before he can turn his attention to us, I calm him. Among the bodies of one of the goons, I find a key. Could this be to the trap door? Of course it is. God hath giveth today. Before I leave, my eyes lock with the man in the cage. Etienne, I think Rulandil called him. No words are spoken, but his eyes are begging, pleading to let him out. I could do it. I think of the trap door. This isn't a fucking rescue mission. I turn my back towards him. He could have been my brother in another life, not this one. I open the trap door, and Malborn and I descend into a dark, freezing cave. We're not alone. The deep, gravelly breathing of a large beast echoes through our rocky escape, a frost troll. At this point, a frost troll is welcomed. I calm the beast, and Malborn and I escape that damned place for good. I'm a damn good undercover agent. I meet back up with Delphine in Riverwood. She tells me that I need to go retrieve Esbern from Riften. Are you fucking kidding me? A rescue mission? I think that poor man Etienne. Why does Esbern get saved but not him? We can't save everybody, but the look he gave me will burn into the back of my mind for as long as I live. What's one more thing on my conscience? There's no rest for the wicked. I need to get to work. I head to Riften, not a clue on where the Ratway Warrens are. Maybe I can convince one of the locals to fill me in. Before I can ask, I hear a voice behind me. You've never done an honest day's work in your life, have you lad? Huh. Honest. Is the blood that stains my fingernails considered honest? This milk drinker smells as slimy as they come, but he seems like he might know something. He wants me to steal a ring and plant it on some poor dark elf. Sure. Whatever I need to do. What's one man's life ruined just so I can save another's? Who am I to be making that call? No. This is more important than any of us. I slip the silver ring into his back pocket and the guards instantly come seize him. I can't even look as it happens. The mastermind of this plan, Brynjolf, I think his name is, tells me that he's part of the infamous Thieves Guild and they set up shop down in the Ratway. God damn, I'm good. Underneath the city, where only the dark and depraved go, that's where I'm headed. It seems quite fitting. I open the iron bars that block the entrance and head inside. I carefully step forward. There's two lowlifes planning on doing whatever to make a quick buck. Who am I to judge them? I could just as easily have been in their position. I don't want to cause a fuss, so I call in both of them. I keep going, not knowing what I'm searching for, a door, anything that will lead me to Esbern. I navigate through the twists and turns of the labyrinth. I think everything is clear, but I soon run into a man in a room full of fucking bear traps. Another calm and some careful steps and we keep moving on. I walk into a large room with a table and another lowlife. I calm them and walk down some stairs that end up leading to the thieves guild. A welcome surprise, as at least I feel confident that these guys won't try and kill me. I see Brynjolf and ask him if he knows anything about Esbern. He looks at me, almost as if I shouldn't be trusted with this information. What does he know that I don't? He gives in and lets me know to follow the tunnels, but to be careful. Jackass, I invented careful. Into the tunnels I go then. I take only five steps before I notice that the place is flooded with Dalmor. Fucking pests. I need to be weary. 
can't calm them all right now. I need to be stealthy. I cast invisibility and creep around them. If I wasn't such a goddamn master of sneak, they would have felt me breathing down their necks. I slip past them and enter a large room. It looks like it's being used as a prison. This must be the Ratway Warrens. I hear people calling to me, begging to be let out. I may be one of the smartest people on Nern, but even an idiot would know not to let these assholes out. There's one cell that looks different from the others. I walk up to it and bang on the door. Twenty seconds go by, nothing. I bang three more times. Finally, someone responds. I need to talk to this guy. Go away. What? I'm a friend. No, that's not me. I'm not Desmond. I don't know what you're talking about. So, now that we've retrieved our sweet Esbern, all we need to do is make it out alive and we'll be free. We've got to get through all the Thalmor that we snuck past earlier, but they turn out to not really be a problem, as they all start attacking Esbern and not us. We leave him to fend for himself and get out of there as quick as possible. This doesn't really work out for us, as it turns out that there are more people waiting for us outside. We calm them and keep moving, but there are even more Thalmor when we go into the next room. We can't even escape at this point, as one of the Thalmor summoned a storm at Janak that's blocking the exit, so we make a quick run from it and start playing Ring Around the Rosie with these guys. By the time we make it back around, our loyal friend Esbern has returned, and has taken all of their hits like a champ. While we're waiting on the storm at Janak to despawn, now's a perfect time to ask you guys to please like and subscribe, as it goes a long way to help a small creator like me. Now that I'm done self-promoting in my own YouTube video, we're able to run past everyone, just barely getting away before one of the lowlifes from earlier hits us with a power attack. Oh Whew, we're finally out of there. We take a carriage to Whiterun where we can buy our new best friend, Sullivan's horse, the second. We're cold, tired, and it's storming and nighttime, so we sleep through the night and head out in the morning. We meet back up with Delphine and come up with a plan to meet at Skyhaven Temple, which apparently holds the answers on how to defeat our big bad Elduin. We take a carriage to Markarth, the closest city to our destination, but before we head to our temple, we need to get the knife for the master alteration quest we got earlier. In the ruins, there are a bunch of Draugr, but at this point, we don't even bother with using Fury. It turns out that it's just way quicker if we just calm everyone. This dungeon is a bit more unique than most of the others, as we start off in the final room, but we need two keys to unlock the path to the knife. It's pretty easy to get the keys, which turn out to be a pair of skulls. Search through the dungeon, calm every jogger we see, and pick up the keys. Big problem for us comes to when we put the keys in the keyholes. See, when we do that, we unlock the path to the knife, but we also awaken an enemy we've never faced before, a dragon priest. We are incredibly bad at combat, which I think we all know at this point. Not only would we be fighting a dragon priest though, but we would also have to fight all of the jogger that we calmed earlier. So. Like always, we avoid all combat, running past the dragon priest, looting the knife, and running out. Now that that's over, we can make our way over to Skyhaven Temple, which might not be the most hospitable place in Skyrim. Since there are so many people here attacking the dragon, we decide to wait and see if the enemies can kill the dragon for us. This, however, doesn't exactly go as planned. Hey, guy. Oh, uh, this game's so fucking easy. Oh my god. Oh my god, this game's so easy. <laughs> oh my god. You're trash, dude. You're absolute shit. Oh fuck, he's here again. Because our invincibility shot's on cooldown, we decide to drink a bonus health and fire resist potion, pop our berserker's rage, and use a ward, which lets us survive the next dragon breath. We decide to stop pressing our luck and run inside the cave we need to enter. Once inside, we calm all the enemies, solve a few puzzles, and throw a fun little blood sacrifice party. And just like that, we're in Skyhaven Temple. Here, we learn the history of how Alduin was defeated in the past with a shout. Unfortunately, it doesn't say much more than that, so we need to head back to High Hrothgar to learn more. The journey there is uneventful, and when we speak with Arngir, he's adamant that we don't learn the shout. Fortunately for us, there's a little bit of divine intervention that comes in the form of a loud, booming voice, and Arngir has a change of heart. He doesn't know the shout, but he can help us get to someone who can. Him and his old people friends teach us to shout clear skies. We then suck off their essence, which we use to open the path to the top of the mountain, where we meet the dragon leader of the Greybeards, Parthenax. It's here that we learn about the shout that defeated Alduin, 
Dragon Rin. Yes, sir. We also learn a fire shout and suck the essence out of Parthenax. Parthenax then tells us that, unfortunately, the Dragon Rin shout has been lost to time, but not all hope is lost. There's a legendary artifact that can help us. The Elder Scroll. With the Elder Scroll, we'll be able to go back in time to when the original heroes used the shout to defeat Alduin. To learn where the Elder Scroll is, we need to head to the College of Winterhold and speak with the Librarian. Before we go, we take a quick rest and learn a perk that makes apprentice level spells free to cast, which will help us deal damage to dragons, something that we desperately need. We make it to the college right in time for a dragon attack, which we let the wizards deal with as we get a sense of deja vu while we hide. After we suck off the dragon, we can use the knife that we looted earlier to harvest some heart skills from it, allowing us to finish the master alteration quest. Before we turn that in though, we finish what we came for and speak with the librarian. He hands us a book with weird, unintelligible writing in it, and to learn more, we need to head north and speak with the author. First on the agenda though is turning in the Master Alteration quest, which we are then rewarded with the spell Dragonhide, which reduces incoming physical damage by 80%. We then head north to the author of the weird book, but it's a much more difficult journey than expected. First, it's incredibly cold, so we'll constantly have our max health drained as well as our speed reduced. Secondly, and more importantly, the water here is freezing cold, and while in freezing cold water, we rapidly lose HP until we're out of the water. So we need to carefully jump across these sheets of ice as one poor decision could end this run. Nice. Thankfully, we make it to the outpost and speak with the author, Septimus Cygnus, who's happy to help us. He tells us that we need to go to the Dwimmer Ruins Black Reach, and gives us some nifty tools to help us unlock the Elder Scroll. We head out from the outpost and only narrowly make it back to Winterhold before freezing to death. From here, we head to Blackreach, running away from a meaty dragon on the way there. Unfortunately, the elevator to Blackreach is locked, so we need to take the long way around. In here, we encounter a few new enemies, the first being a dwarven spider, which uses some interesting techniques to attack us. Oh, what the hell? He just exploded on me. Don't clip that. That <laughs> I realize how how that might have sounded. I didn't, I meant like, with like, shock, like energy and stuff. I didn't, Never mind. A little further ahead, and we find a nifty little spot that lets us power level our conjuration. Unlike the other times we power leveled, summon spells do require an enemy nearby to gain XP. Usually that would prevent power leveling, as we would always be in constant danger, but the spot that we're in isn't accessible by the enemies below, so we are at risk of them attacking us. So, we turn on a Nile Blue video and start summoning. Half an hour later, we've got level 100 Conjuration, and we're ready to roll. The rest of the ruins are simple enough, we just calm everyone we see and keep moving forward. We leave the Dwemer ruins and officially enter Blackreach, but we just run right through until we reach the elevator to the final room of the dungeon. In here, we solve a quick puzzle after trying every combination of the solution six times, and our expert intellect is rewarded with the Elder Scroll. Once we leave, First on the itinerary is completing the Master Conjuration quest. We head to the College of Winterhold, speak to the Conjuration teacher, and learn that we need to convince a Tremora Lord to give us his Sigil Stone. Sounds easy enough. We head to the roof of the college and summon the Tremora Lord. Unfortunately for us, he doesn't seem to want to give it. Unfortunately for him, we're able to just firebolt him until he dies. This cycle of summoning and killing happens two more times before he finally lets up and gives us his Sigil Stone. We show it to the Conjuration Teacher and he teaches us the Flame Thrall spell, which lets us summon a Flame Atronach that never expires. We also buy the Dead Thrall spell from him, which lets us reanimate most dead people and they can't expire either. Before we head back to Parthenax, we realize that we've got a couple problems. The first problem is that we still suck at killing dragons. When we fight Alduin for the first time, we won't have any townspeople or wizards or Delphine to help us kill him. Of course, instead of confronting the problem head on, we'll be avoiding the problem entirely by resurrecting overpowered thralls. Second problem is that we're still not exactly great at tanking dragon breaths. That dragon hide spell we got only protects against physical moves and dragon breath counts as magic damage. Yes, we've got some temporary ways to prevent damage such as our workish ability and our invincibility shout, but both of those have cooldowns, so we can't really rely on them to always save us. The solution to this problem is a bit more straightforward to solve as we just need to boost our magic resistance through the roof. We start our path to being Alduin ready by heading to Whiterun, 
where we immediately get attacked by a dragon. This is a simple fight, though, as it's just a regular dragon, and we can just let the guards take care of it. After killing it, again, we suck the soul out of its body and head around the perimeter of Whiterun where we meet a few bandits. We kill them, resurrect the strongest one, and head to Riften. This may seem like an odd move, but there's actually a quest in Riften that gives us 15% magic resistance. This quest, as it turns out, was quite the pain in our rear end, because we ended up encountering 13 cave bears, 8 wolves, 2 frostbite spiders, a thief, and an evil wizard just in the first stage of this quest. The second stage of this quest is pretty simple, we just had to help two old people get their freak on. The third stage of this quest was just as bad as the first though. Our first problem here is that we need to go to the middle of nowhere in Ohio to help out these ghosts. All around the area though are saber cats that could one shot us if we're not careful. As if this wasn't bad enough, dragons have a high chance to spawn in the surrounding areas. An ancient dragon got close to attacking us but decided to attack a nearby giant instead which was great for us because the giant was able to help kill the dragon. We suck off the dragon and finish the quest. We head back to Riften to turn the quest in, gain 15% magic resist, and learn a perk that grants us one additional summon. We're not quite ready for the Alduin fight yet though. Now that we're pretty much done leveling up our magic skills, we can trade out that standing stone ability we got at the very start of the challenge for something that'll help us win. We need to head to Morthal so that we can journey to the Lordstone and get 50 bonus armor and 25% more magic resist. On our way, we almost lose a run to a snowy saber cat, just barely drinking a potion in time before we died. We then run into a few bandits attacking a master conjurer. Usually we would just calm everyone and run by, but that conjurer would actually be a great thrall. So we cast fury and let them kill each other and then finish off the master conjurer. After we cast dead thrall on her, we activate the Lord Stone, meaning that our magic resist is now 15% from this necklace, 15% from the quest in Riften, and now 25% from the Lord Stone, totaling 55% magic resistance. We're now a lot more ready for the Alduin fight. One of the final things we need to do is to get a second overpowered thrall. After a bit of research, I learn of a powerful warlock named Sild near Whiterun. So we head back to Whiterun, and in typical Sullivan fashion, we get attacked by an elder dragon. Like our first dragon fight, we decide to take cover in the watchtower while the guards and the giant took it out. After we serenely suck the essence out of the dragon, we head to the dungeon that Sild the Warlock resides in, kill all the ghosts inside, and prepare for a big fight. There's a trap door in the center of the room, and once we drop down, Sild will attack us. So, we need to carefully plan... our thralls fell into the trap. We let them duke it out for a bit before popping our orcish ability and dropping down to finish him off. Where? No more. Oh. Okay, well. I... <laughs> that was very anticlimactic. For now that we've got two overpowered thralls, there's only one thing we need to do before we're ready to take on Alduin. Alduin, being the leader of all this mess, is much stronger than the other dragons. He takes half damage from all sources with an additional 50% fire and 25% frost resist. For those who are keeping track, that's 1 fourth damage from legendary difficulty times 1 half damage for Alduin times 1 half fire damage means that our fire bolt spell deals 1 16th base damage. What this means is that shock spells are our best bet. On top of this, dragons actually need mana to cast their dragon breath and our shock spells deal damage to magicka so it's win win. We make a quick stop by our favorite court wizard, by a lightning bolt, and head off to fight the big bad Alduin. We make our way to the throat of the world, read the Elder Scroll, learn the dragon Ren shout from the heroes of the past, and begin our fight with Alduin. Right off the bat, things go horribly wrong. Apparently, when we went back into the past, our thralls died. So before we can do anything, we need to resurrect both of them. We're only able to resurrect the Master Conjurer before we start getting attacked, so we cast Iron Flesh while we wait for an opening. Now, I know what you're thinking. Edge, why do we go through all this trouble to get the Dragon Hide spell if we're not even going to use it? Well, my furry little friend, Dragon Hide, as it turns out, kinda sucks in combat. The 80% reduced physical damage is nice, but it only lasts for 60 seconds, requires most of our mana, and we need to channel it for a few seconds before we can even cast it. So, we're sticking to Iron Flesh quick one-handed spell that uses little mana and lasts for two minutes. 
We resurrect Sild, and the rest of the fight is hectic to say the least. Alduin has multiple attacks at his disposal. He's got the typical dragon melee attacks, fire breath, frost breath, unrelenting force, and a fun little shout that's unique to him called Meteor Storm. This shout, unsurprisingly, causes meteors to fall from the sky for 30 seconds. Now, Alduin may be smart, but we're smarter, and we can use clear skies to stop the meteors from falling. Another thing that makes Alduin different from the other dragons is that he can't take damage while flying, meaning that all the spells that we and our thralls cast are useless until he's on the ground. Thankfully, there's a shout for that, the new dragon ring shout we just got. We just need to use this shout on Alduin whenever he's in the air, and it'll cause him to land, where we'll finally be able to deal damage to him. Now that he's on the ground, we just need to send a barrage of lightning bolts his way, and since lightning bolt is an apprentice level spell, it's free to cast, letting us spam away. The way the rest of the fight plays out is pretty simple. Every time he uses Meteor Storm, we use Clear Skies. Every time he starts flying, we use Dragon Rend. Every time he's on the ground, well, spam Lightning Bolt. Thankfully for us, he seems to be taking a special interest in our thralls, and he hardly ever targets us for the entire battle. After slowly chipping down his health, 15 minutes later, we finally kill Alduin and finish our challenge. JK lol. Alduin actually doesn't die, because apparently he can't be killed here, which seems pretty convenient for him, but okay. To learn where he went, we need to trap one of his dragon friends who will rat him out for us. Oddly convenient for us though, is how Whiterun just so happens to have a dragon trapping mechanism that we could use. We talk to the Yara of Whiterun, but for some reason, he doesn't want us luring a dragon to the city. But he could be convinced if we temporarily stop the civil war going on in Skyrim. Pretty much. All we need to do is convince the Stormcloaks and Imperials to come to a peace conference. This takes us about an hour, but most of it's just walking. Some things to note though, we encountered a dragon near Whiterun, which we kill in Second Soul, we head to Winterhold to get the spell Stormthrall, and from there we were on our way to Windhelm when we encountered an assassin, which was milliseconds away from ending our run, and then a snowy saber cat almost one-shots us, reminding us that even though we won our first Alduin fight, that doesn't mean we're invincible. Once we're back at High Hrothgar for the peace negotiations, we sit through the most boring 10 minute dialogue sequence. Hey. Thank you. Oh, never mind. All right. Learn a shout to call the dragon and get the green light to trap it in white run. On our way there, we get to watch a giant taking a joyride on a dragon, so that's pretty cool. We get to the trap, call the dragon, and after a little bit of combat, we trap him. After a little conversation, we learn that Alduin didn't just fly away, but he went to another plane of existence, Sovngarde, the Nordic afterlife. This sucks for us. We aren't Nords, so it'd be a bit tricky for us to get there. On top of that, I think we would technically lose the challenge if we had to Skyrim ourselves to beat the game. Lucky for us, there just so happens to be a portal of Sovngarde. All we need to do is write our new friend Odaving, and he'll take us there. This is the last leg of the game, and once we leave, we won't be coming back. So before we go, we get a good night's rest, stock up on potions, and head off to the most difficult section of the game. We land outside the temple, and immediately our worst fear has come to pass. Our dead thralls couldn't follow us here, so we're on our own. We prepared for the worst though, and we can summon a couple storm thralls from the spell we bought earlier. From here, we can see a few draugr blocking our path, and we try taking them out when a dragon so kindly decides to attack. Unfortunately, our storm thralls thought that they were better off in the ravine beneath us, so they won't be much help this fight. We don't have the firepower to fight the draugr and the dragon at the same time, so we need to juggle between calming the draugr and dealing damage to the dragon. Because of our magic resistance and the max health we've been increasing every time we level up, this dragon actually isn't that big of a threat, as we're able to tank a fire breath without losing that much health. We take out the dragon, suck the soul out of its body, and keep moving forward until two minutes later when another dragon attacks. This battle goes the same as the last one, calming all the nearby Draugr while we take out the dragon. We suck its soul, doing one final wave of calm on all the incredibly high level Draugr around us and walk inside the temple. Most of this dungeon is simple, we just calm every enemy we see, solve a few puzzles and make our way forward. This doesn't take us all the way there however, as there's a Draugr Scourge Lord that we need to kill to get a key. One minute of firebolt spam later and we're able to get the key and leave. Before we enter the final area before Sovngarde, we encounter a bit of a problem, which I'll let myself explain. So, what's gonna happen? 
that there will be a portal, there will be a staff, and then there will be a sleeping dragon priest. So, when the dragon priest wakes up, he's going to take the staff, he's going to close the portal. I think that if I can get the staff before he does, then I don't have to even fight him. Which be would be amazing. Because I don't know how I'm going to kill a dragon priest. I haven't done it yet. I don't even know if illusion spells work on him. So... I'm going to try and whirlwind sprint past him and jump into the portal. Where? Where? Who's mad at me? Okay, this guy's mad at me. That guy's mad at me. Go, 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 go. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Let's pause. So I was a bit confused on what we actually had to do. I thought we had to take the staff and then jump in, but it all worked out in the end, just barely. And we're officially in Sovngarde. After walking through some fog, we get to a bridge guarded by a dude that wants us to prove our worth. This guy's absolute weak sauce though, and we're granted passage into the Hall of Valor. Once inside, we encounter the heroes of the past that we watch defeat Alduin, and after a brief conversation, they agree to help us defeat him once and for all. We head back across the bridge, clear the fog, and Alduin decides to make his final stand. Now, I know that the entire challenge has led up to this final epic battle, but if there's anything that we've learned throughout the course of this challenge, it's that dragon fights are so much easier when we've got friends fighting with us. So, like the last Alduin fight, we just use Clear Skies, Dragonrend, and whittle his health bar down. Once Alduin has surrendered, we put our spells away for the first time this entire challenge and beat him with one solid punch. With that, he explodes everywhere and I suck the soul out of his body, finishing him off. That's officially the end of the challenge. Oh After 44 God. days, 15 essences suck, one lengthy monologue, and zero deaths, we can say that we were the first to beat Skyrim beyond legendary. This was a mighty deed. This was a mighty deed. at last and cleansed his sovereign guard of his evil snare. Hey haters, haters, look at me. Look at me. Haters. But your fate Haters, suffer. look at me. I got two we things for you. Your count of days. Thing one, welcome you again. thing two. Glad friendship. These are for you, haters. I got one, one thing that I still need to do. I'd like to give one final shout out to all the viewers that came to watch me live, which you, yes you, are also welcome to do. In fact, if I hit 50 followers on my Twitch channel, linked down below, I'll start a new Skyrim challenge where I speedrun beating the Companions Guild while only using unarmed attacks. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> uh, get me out of this fucking game. All right. Uh, that's it. Thanks for watching, and uh, let me know what you want me to do next. Bye. Thank you.